I sat back on my lounge chair after quickly taking a sip of the large, ice-cold cocktail the waiter had just brought out, and I had just returned my attention to all those young bodies, almost naked, dressed in tiny bikinis, when I saw her emerging from the water, like Aphrodite, from the sea in the Greek legend. Or should I say I noticed a little black bikini? It's hard to say what caught my attention first. From the moment I saw this slender body, I knew that it was very familiar to me, even at this distance, about 200 yards or so, but I could not put my finger on exactly what. However, as the woman moved up the beach in my general direction, her hand came up and removed the matching black swim cap from her head. The moment those fiery red locks unfurled, I knew exactly who she was, but I couldn't figure out how she ended up on the same island, let alone beach, as me, several thousand miles from our hometown. I might not have known she was on the island, but as she approached, it became obvious that she was aware of my presence. And what's more, she's heading straight towards me. She must have had prior knowledge of my presence and exact location, because I had difficulty recognizing her from that distance, despite her red hair. There was no way that she could have noticed me, almost lying on the lounge chair like I was. Of course, it never occurred to me that she might have already noticed me before she entered the sea and decided to make a dramatic entrance. But that didn't do anything for her because I pretended to be asleep behind my sunglasses. I wore mirrored sunglasses so women wouldn't notice me staring at their slender bodies as they walked past on the beach and hotel patio where I was lying. I am not without attractiveness, but at 33, feeling more like 53, I did not consider myself among those who could attract attention, even while on vacation. By that time, I had already had my fill of close encounters with the female sex. Two failed marriages and one failed long-term relationship was enough for me. Thank you very much. I was quite happy to lie there and fantasize. Thank you. Mary Beth walked straight to the foot of my lounge chair and then stood there looking down at me with her hands on her hips. I pretended to be fast asleep. She coughed once and then said, ahem, a little later. Still, I didn't move a muscle, focusing my mind on breathing deeply and evenly. With luck, she'll think I'm in an alcoholic stupor and leave. She finally called my name, but I still didn't react. Then she said, damn you, Tony Smart, why do you have to drink so damn much all the time? Then she turned and walked past me into the hotel. I gave her enough time to get out of sight before checking that the coast was clear. Crap, I said out loud. What the hell is she doing here? I met Mary Beth Thomas for the first time. That's it, Mary Beth, by the way, not Mary Elizabeth. Woe to anyone who ever called Mary Beth Elizabeth. Apparently she was named after some American actress her grandfather liked in his youth. As the first girl born into the family, Mary Beth was so named, presumably to make the old man happy. So I first encountered it on my first day at technical college. Along with many other students, I was wandering around the lecture hall that was to become our home base for the year when Mary Beth made her entrance. With her adorable slender body and that fiery red hair, no guy in the room could miss her. Every man's eyes in the room, no matter who they were supposedly talking to, were fixed on Mary Beth as she walked up to the lecturer and asked him where she should sit. The lecturer's type playfully suggested the front row, where he could watch her in a friendly manner. Beth chose this moment to show off her loud voice and called him an old pervert, albeit with some playfulness in her voice, and everyone took it as a joke. Mary Beth then cast a disdainful glance at one poor fellow as she passed him on her way to the back of the classroom, where she very soon gathered around her a small group of female fans of the Queen. Mary Beth was right about one thing, she did need to keep an eye on the boys. Very soon, almost all the more or less attractive guys from our class and many from other classes began to make proposals to her and invite her on dates. We must give her credit, she didn't lead any of the guys by the nose. In fact, she rejected them quite, unequivocally, and, of course, always in full voice. Eventually, almost all the guys got the hint and stopped pestering her with offers of dates which I guess was Mary Beth's plan. Another weird thing about Mary Beth. Well, isn't it weird? 
a very beautiful young woman who basically kept every guy at arm's length, no matter how beautiful they were. Damn weird, if you ask me, I thought at the time, but later I learned otherwise. In any case, a few weeks later, a rumor spread among the young wolves of the college that Mary Beth preferred girls, I guess to justify the fact that they couldn't even get her to go out on a date. Anyway, the weirdness I'm talking about was about her group of girlfriends. Unlike most angry girl groups, this was obviously not a closed club. There was also no need for any girl to particularly fit the ideas of the leader, mainly Mary Beth, because she couldn't tolerate female intimidation of any kind. Any shy girl was obviously welcome in this small, eventually very large, gang. The one thing they all had in common was that they were all very committed and vocal on the subject when it came to the women's liberation movement. But we will not focus on this. It is not directly related to history. As I watched Mary Beth appear that first day, I thought I had judged the situation correctly, and I wasn't about to become the butt of ridicule by trying my luck, no matter how much I wanted to. There were many other fish in the sea to chase. I have always believed that there is little point in wasting time chasing the unattainable. Let's say about six months passed when we were assigned group projects by our physics teacher. He selected members of the group at random, drawing their names from a hat, or more accurately, from a trash can. It was quite a surprise to discover that Mary Beth had joined the group that I was in. What was even more surprising was that she spoke very little on the first day. It didn't occur to me right away, but physics clearly wasn't Mary Beth's strong suit. By the third or fourth week of the project, Mary Beth was really lagging behind and slowing down the entire group, and some group members even dared to voice their dissatisfaction with her. Strangely, Mary Beth did not reciprocate their feelings, but looked embarrassed. Tony, do you have a minute? The teacher called me at the end of the lesson. I turned around and saw him standing there with Mary Beth next to him. What happened, boss? I said, approaching his table. Mary Beth is having difficulty with this project. She asked me to remove her from your group because she is slowing down the others. I stood and looked at him not understanding why he decided that I should be the natural leader of the group, which, in fact, I was not. This is your area, Tony. You are ahead of the rest. Could you take the time to prepare Mary Beth and bring her up to par? Probably. But what does Mary think about it? Mary Beth is ready to try, Mary answered, correcting me, not for the first or last time, regarding her name. Okay, girl. I'll meet you in the cafeteria after school ends, and we'll see what we can arrange, I answered. Then I got out of there before she could respond to the girl's comment. Yes, I teased her a little, but I was a young man who loved to go out and have fun. I had enough to worry about with my own training. I really didn't want to waste my time tutoring someone who wasn't even interested in me. Yeah, well, throw dirt on something, and eventually something will stick. I've never seen her with a guy since we all arrived at college, and no one, well, a guy anyway, has ever claimed to have gone out with her. Well, we can't do much here. It's too damn noisy, I said to Mary Beth when I joined her in the dining room that evening. In the library, she suggested. Yeah, but everyone there gets mad if you talk too much. What about where you live? About a mile from here but I don't think my dad would like it. He's a little paranoid about me and the boys. Mary Beth, I'm not your damn boyfriend. I have to teach you physics. Tell your father that if you don't get help, you'll be kicked out. He'll have to agree. I would say that you could come to my house, but my brothers would have their tongues hanging out the whole time. We just won't get any peace. Then I'll talk to him. Give me your number. She answered. Her father continued to look at me strangely, but never said anything. Mary Beth's mom was wonderful and always tried to feed me. When I walked around their house, I was usually invited to have dinner with them. Just saying grace before eating surprised me a little. As the months passed, I eventually brought Mary Beth up to date. But once the project was completed, she still continued to ask me for help. It seemed that I would have to tutor her in physics for the rest of our student life. Not that I minded too much, once you got past that facade, she was actually quite nice for someone like her. Tony, are you weird? You might have knocked me off my feet when Mary Beth asked me this, 
about the third week of my sophomore year of college. No, hell no, I answered angrily. Sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. I'm just wondering because you've never once offended me. You are probably the only man in the entire college who was not offended by me. At one point or another, this applies to half of the teachers. I don't take rejection very well, Mary, and you have a reputation for turning down everyone who's ever asked you out. You do realize that there are people in this college who tell you to go the other way, right? You? She asked. Honest answer? I asked. The honest answer is, I'm thick-skinned, she assured me. Well, I actually wondered about this at one time, but I know you well enough now that I've never seen anything to make me believe you rock like that. Thank you, and for your information, I don't know. I am very wary of all men, to both young and old. Damn it, you weren't... No, no, if you did, you would have kissed me years ago. Lord, I gave you every opportunity, she announced. This is news to me. Yes, I see. Well, if you don't want to see the damn bait, I better take the bull by the horns, don't I? She said, then wrapped her arms around my neck and pulled me into a hug, right in the middle of the university cafeteria, in front of everyone. The next thing I remember, there was applause all around us. I happily admit that this may have been the best kiss of my life. However, I was somewhat embarrassed by the attention we received from our audience. I had no choice but to hug Mary Beth. God, how nice it was to have those two breasts pressed against my chest. It was true. From that day on, Mary Beth and I became one. Even her old man seemed to accept this fact. The years passed, and at the age of 19, I went to college on the South Coast to study engineering. Mary Beth, who had by then left the education system, came with me, and we lived in the dirtiest one-room apartment you've ever seen. However, we were happy there together. For a while, Beth found a job and went to work every day, and I, of course, went to school. Most evenings, we worked together in the pub for extra money. Well, this apartment was such a dump. Mary Beth wouldn't want to be here alone. As I approached my final exams, everything around us turned upside down. I think I was a little shocked by Mary Beth's reaction when I proposed getting married right after I graduated. Mary Beth panicked and muttered something about not being ready to get married yet. After that day, we seemed to argue about nothing all the time. It was as if every time I opened my mouth, I was waving a red rag in front of the bull. Finally, the night after I took my final exams, we somehow ended up doing hammer and tongs. I guess a lot of things were said that really shouldn't have been said, but I really can't remember what they were. Damn if I can now remember what started the argument. In any case, when I got home the next evening, I still had some college affairs to get in order, Mary Beth packed up her things and went home to mom and dad. Well, that's what the hastily written note implied. No goodbyes or anything like that. A neighbor described what I believed to be Mary Beth's father's car, parked outside the apartment late that morning. I can tell you that I was very upset when this happened, but at the same time I was very angry. God, we spent five years on our relationship and Mary Beth walked away like it was nothing at all. When I told my parents what happened, they suggested that I call Mary Beth and discuss the situation with her. But I was adamant that I wasn't going to do it. She left me. I thought she must come and find me again. They even went so far as to tell me that Beth had called their house looking for me, but I never believed them. I told them I tried to call her back, but I didn't actually do so. Yes, well, I was very angry at this turn of events because, as I saw it, Mary Beth had to do this damn humiliation. I must say that by this time I was already accustomed to living outside the horde and found myself a nice apartment, even before I returned to my hometown from university. Well, I originally intended that Mary Beth and I would begin our married life by living there together, but it served no worse than a bachelor's apartment, somewhere where I could win all the conquests that a free man can have, if you know what I mean. My relationship with Mary Beth left one very unexpected legacy being known as the guy who caught the most beautiful girl in the heart of the city, who, by the way, had a reputation as an ice maiden, and kept her for five years somehow, raised my profile among all the single women in the area. Okay? And maybe those who didn't stay away, when I first looked their way, didn't make me everyone's favorite in town either. I'm sure a few guys got a little mad at me about it and it's quite possible that it came back and bit me a few years later 
no one will ever know. Lord, I discovered that I really was like a child who had been let out in a candy store. Almost every bird I looked at was more than happy to go on a date with me, and many with the same desire climbed into my bed. Since it's not a very big city, I always knew it was only natural that I would run into Mary Beth at the few good night spots we had. Although I didn't expect to run into her, another guy, almost every time I ask a girl out. God, she was a bitch. The moment she saw me, she would lead her date around the dance floor until they were right in front of us. Then they spent most of the evening prancing around with their arms wrapped around her while Mary Beth glared at me and my companion. However, I soon found an antidote to her behavior. Once Mary Beth and her companion were positioned so that she was satisfied, I would pull my companion closer and kiss her stupidly. Usually Mary Beth and her boyfriend walked away when I finally broke the kiss. For some reason, this also earned me a reputation as a good kisser. I think I came back from university about six months later when I picked up Sally somewhere. I don't remember where we met. I can only assume that she was one of the girls who was always somewhere. Let's say I always knew about her, but at the same time I didn't know her. All I can remember about that evening is driving her home one night, kissing her, and most likely getting a weird hug or two along the way. Yes, I didn't care. I took a lot of liberties. If the girls didn't like it, well, there were still plenty of fish in the sea. The next evening was Friday, and right after I got home from work, I found a message on my answering machine from Sally asking, what time would I pick her up? Well, that evening we went dancing, and after much muttering and swearing, she deigned to come back with me to my apartment for the night. What surprised me was not that she wanted it so much, but that she was almost completely inexperienced. God, I had to cut back on work to get her up to speed. We experimented quite well. Somehow Sally and I ended up as a couple, perhaps more because we had so much fun in the bedroom, or whatever room we liked in the apartment, than anywhere else. Then, out of the blue, just after Christmas, Sally dropped a bombshell on me. She was pregnant. I have no idea what went wrong. We took all the necessary precautions. But such things happen. There is no method of contraception, short of complete abstinence, that is completely reliable. We got married less than two weeks after that. Unfortunately, Sally's pregnancy was not completed. I'm not really sure what went wrong because the doctors say all this technical blah blah. In any case, Sally herself contracted some kind of infection and almost died. It's been a tough couple of months for both of us, I can assure you. But once she got better and we added the circle to our precautions, we resumed our sex life with the same enthusiasm we started with when we first met. The problem is that after a few months I discovered that Sally was interested in an open relationship. Her, or maybe my problem, was that she didn't seem to understand that in order to open a relationship, both partners had to be on board with the plan. Or did it have to be an act? Getting into another relationship without your partner really isn't fair, is it? The divorce was peaceful and very quick. I really didn't see the point in being upset about it, especially when Sally was happy to have sex with me, even after the divorce. Not that I do it very often. I had no idea who else she had sex with. After Sally, I somehow lost trust in women. Hey, maybe that's why I still sleep with Sally sometimes. I knew she was cheating on me so I couldn't possibly be disappointed again. But then Jane came into the picture. I met Jane in the office. More precisely, we were stuck in an elevator together, in the dark, during a power outage. We sat there in the dark and talked about our lives, having no idea what each other looked like. God, was I surprised when the lights came on. For some reason, even the emergency lights didn't turn on when the power went out. And who the hell would more than take a quick glance at someone else getting into an elevator with them when it's just the two of you? Yes. If the elevator is crowded and a young lady's attractive butt is entering, most guys will try to position themselves to get a good look at her. But when it's just the two of you in the elevator, suddenly the panel with floor numbers becomes extremely interesting, otherwise you might get a slap in the face. When the elevator suddenly stopped and we found ourselves in complete darkness, in the end, you have to start a conversation with your companion in order to somehow calm him down. You know, we both had cigarettes, but neither of us had a working lighter. 
By the time the power came back, we both promised to quit the damn habit. We met again a few days later to make sure we both kept our promise. This meeting led to a date, and, well, eight months later, we left the registry office as husband and wife, but not before Jane informed me that we would not have children. Jane was born with deformed ovaries, and they had to be removed almost as soon as she reached puberty, due to some complications or something else, the details of which she never went into. Honestly, I feel a little bad when people start talking about all this medical stuff. Jane also told me that she has to take hormone replacement pills every day, as some women do when they reach menopause. What do they call it? Menopause? Although the thought of not having biological children of our own was a blow to me. Jane accepted her fate many years ago. We discussed the possibility of adoption in the future. And there were some unexpected benefits to living with a woman who doesn't menstruate. No PMS, like Mary Beth sometimes had, and no missing a few nights every month. The only unpredictable change was the apparent change in Jane's sexual appetite or libido, which appeared to be related to the pills she took every day. Of course, Jane had known about this for years, and, without telling me until after our wedding, she changed the dosage of her pills to take it into account. Whether it was an overdose or an underdose of one particular pill, I could never figure out. But when she was wrong, God, this woman was merciless. Yet others have had worse crosses along the way. The mention of Mary Beth reminds me again. With hindsight, I realized that a very strange event had occurred concerning her. Remember I said that when I got back from university, she seemed to be everywhere I went on a date. But the strange thing was that after I married Sally, Mary Beth disappeared from the face of the earth, only to reappear while I was dating Jane. But once Jane and I got married, well, damn it, no more Mary Beth again. I hardly ever saw her anywhere in the city except sometimes on Main Street on Saturdays, and even then she seemed to avoid eye contact with me. Not that I made it clear that I cared. Working in the same building, Jane and I probably spent more time together than most newlyweds. We drove to and from work together and had lunch together every day. Our free time, when we weren't trying to have sex with each other, mostly revolved around golf and line dancing. Golf was a hobby of mine that Jane took up with far more enthusiasm than I did with her line dancing, although I have to admit it was fun once you get into it. We also tried other leisure activities, bowling, yoga, horse riding in one summer and water skiing in another. The riding stopped when Jane fell from her horse. Water skiing ended when I broke my leg. Yoga came and went as we pleased and bowling. Well, we were both absolute noobs at it, but we still went once a month or so and laughed at ourselves. Over the next few years, everything was theoretically perfect. I got a promotion and we bought a nice little house. Jane changed jobs in the company, but for a long time, we could not work in the same department. Then suddenly, and completely unexpectedly, I was offered a position in the same department as Jane. I accepted it, although it cost me some loss of seniority. Unfortunately, at the time, Jane was the secretary for a guy named Jack Prout, Prouty to most people behind his back. Jack Prout had seniority over me, and he made it absolutely clear from my first day in the department that there was no way I was going to have Jane as my secretary. Not that it really mattered, because my desk, being new, was in the same office as Jane's. Although we knew that once I rose through the ranks, I would get a private office like most of the other guys. Another unexpected wrinkle in our master plan was that, as a new employee, Jim Martin, the department manager, decided that I needed to become familiar with the department's clients, which resulted in numerous business trips across the country. Instead of spending more time together, Jane and I were separated more than ever since we were stuck in an elevator together. We had been married for over four years at this point, so we just sucked it up and got through it. We knew that once I met, spent some time with clients and got to know them, I wouldn't be away as much. Well, this was the state of affairs when I suddenly realized that not everything was as smooth as it should be. Two pieces of intercepted conversation told me that someone was pulling my strings, and I really lost my temper about it. Taken separately, they meant almost nothing. Together, these fragments have led to things going from bad to worse. 
I intercepted the first one near the elevators one day. I was carrying three boxes of papers and stepped aside so that the people in the elevator could exit before I entered. But when two guys got out of the elevator, one said to the other, Damn, once she starts, nothing stops her. You know, she almost killed the four of us. The guy suddenly stopped talking when he saw me standing next to him. His silence made his words burn into my brain. Then about a week or so later, I was walking into the tea shop one morning when I heard one of the other guys say, Yeah, Prouty changed her pills. She was ready for sex when we arrived. Again, the guy stopped talking when he realized it was me entering the tea shop, and they both avoided my gaze as they hurriedly left. Now, even if Jane hadn't been possessed when I got home from a business trip the previous evening, I would still have realized what was going on. There was only one, woman whose purse was in Jack Prout's office. How kind of him to offer to lock her in his safe every day. And I still wonder how long the bastard has been messing around with Jane's pills. Besides, how long had he been in bed with her? Filled with rage, I rushed from the tea room to Prouty's office, where Jane was taking dictation from him. My unexpected and sudden arrival must have told him that I had figured out the bastard, because he tried to squeeze his chair through the far wall. But I was on him, took him by the neck with both hands, and began to squeeze as hard as I could. No, Tony, please don't kill him, Jane begged me. Why do you love him so much? I blurted out in response. No, I hate him for what he did to me, she answered. So you knew he was messing with your medications? I asked. Oh God, you damn idiot, no wonder I couldn't control myself, she screamed. And then suddenly, I realized that I had to let go of Prouty in order to contain Jane. She picked up a large metal trophy that was sitting on his desk and was about to drive it into his skull when I grabbed her. I don't know. My need to protect my wife from doing something that would land her in jail for a long time somehow became more important than my need to kill the bastard myself. You bastard, my medications must be balanced very carefully. You could have killed me, Jane screamed at the top of her voice as we competed for the trophy. I found out that this had been going on almost since I was transferred to the department. In fact, I was moved to an office for the express purpose of getting me out of the way. Moreover, the head of the department was one of the guys that Prouty brought to our house. The end result was that Jane and I divorced quite quickly. I knew that she was not complicit in Prouty's plan. In fact, she always tried to be close to me because she was afraid of what might happen if she got the dosage wrong at some point. Look. It's not like a faucet. The pill regulates your hormone levels, but it takes a few days for the dosage changes to take effect. How Prody knew what Jane's medicine was for, we never found out. We can only assume that he went through Jane's bag at some point and found them. Two minutes on the internet could have told him what it was and what impact it could have. We then assume that he obtained stronger ones from somewhere and made replacements. I was transferred to the department to facilitate his use of this replacement. As in the case of Sally, we remained in the house, and even in the same bed, until the official divorce. Look, Jane got a new prescription and immediately adjusted her dosage. But she was still on a sexual high, and we both knew it would take her a while to get back to normal. God knows who she could have gotten into bed if it weren't for me. A couple of times before the official divorce, Jane began to ask me if we could stay together. She never finished the question, so she must have been able to read the answer in my eyes. With a good amount of money in my account, no job, and a story of my wife enjoying sex with half the men in my office, I saw little point in staying in the city, just like Jane. As soon as we sold the house, Jane went north somewhere, and I headed to the airport. My goal was to see the world, somewhat like a backpacker, but on a bigger budget. I'm really not one to like cheap hotels or hostels, too old for this. So here I am, lying on a deck chair on the patio of a hotel on an island in the South Seas, wondering how Mary Beth Thomas, by a twisted trick of fate, has ended up here too. Although I tried to return to my usual activity of watching the scenery pass by and imagining what I could teach them in my room, I could not. Mary Beth kept appearing in my daydreams and ruining everything. After an hour or so, I gave up. Well, I tried to resume my daydreams for a while longer, 
but there was no way to settle down and enjoy your imagination if Mary Beth was anywhere nearby. Memories of our relationship kept popping up and getting in the way. I decided that if Mary Beth stayed at the hotel, I would be moving on to pastures new. Hey, there are many islands, and each of them has the same number of hotels. Okay, maybe they weren't all that popular with Aussie girls, but most of them had a lot of talent and food for naughty thoughts. I must have looked very funny. I know I looked noticeably strange as I headed back to the hotel. Without realizing it, I must have been sneaking glances this way and that, hoping to spot Mary Beth before she saw me. If I had noticed her, I would have hurried in the opposite direction as quickly as possible. I believe I was unknowingly hidden behind a pillar, trying to get a good look at everyone in the bar to make sure Mary Beth wasn't there, when one of the hotel staff asked, Something's wrong? Have you lost something, Mr. Smart? No, no, I'm fine, thanks, Zack. I answered, turning my head. If you need anything, sir, you know all you have to do is ask, he said, emphasizing the word something. Yes, Zack was that type. Usually every luxury hotel has one pseudo-pimp. Well, there's one thing, Zack. Have you noticed the red-haired lady who arrived perhaps in the last few days? Nice figure. Long, curly, red hair. It was surprising to notice that I gave Zack descriptive hand gestures to emphasize what I was saying. It's strange, really, because Zack spoke English probably better than me. No, sir. I don't think we've had any red-haired ladies in the last week or so, Zack replied. Are you sure? She was on the beach about an hour ago. Are you sure, sir? You know, when the sun is at the right angle, it can change the color of almost anything. But not that red hair? Are you sure she's not registered? If you know the lady's name? We can check from the register, sir. Zack said as he walked towards the front desk. I followed him, still furtively trying to look around in all directions at once. The lady's name, sir? Zack asked, opening the magazine on the counter and waiting for my answer. Thomas, Mary Beth Thomas, I answered. Zack began turning the pages, repeating the name Thomas out loud. No, sir, we haven't had Thomas living here for two months. What about Mary Beth, another last name? She might have gotten married. Zack went back to flipping through the logbook, this time repeating Mary Beth to himself. No, sir, we have had neither Mary Beth nor Mary Elizabeth this year. If she is here then this lady must be traveling under a supposed name. Shouldn't you have their real names on the register? You know, like with our passports? On the official record, sir, but it's only a copy of the logbook. We've had a lot of very famous people stay here, and very often they choose to travel incognito. Is this a different register? Sorry, sir, but if she's not on this register, she's not staying here. Zack raised his eyebrows, and I realized that I wouldn't get any more information from him, but I tried anyway. Is there a place you could suggest I look? I asked him. Sir, I had the day off yesterday, but I've been here since six o'clock this morning, mostly in this hall. During that time, I can assure you that I haven't seen any red-haired ladies. I couldn't think of any reason why Zack would lie to me. He was more of the type who would offer to sell me information if he had it. So a thought started to creep into my head. Maybe I was actually asleep and dreamed that I saw Mary Beth on the beach. After thinking about this, I felt a little calmer and headed to my bungalow. Or maybe it would be better to describe it as a little thatched house. As soon as I got there, I took a shower. And then, still completely naked but with a towel wrapped around my waist, turned on my computer and wrote short letters to my parents and brothers. I have attached beautiful photographs of the panoramic views that I took with my digital camera to each one. Letters to my three brothers, however, were always accompanied by photographs of young girls in swimsuits, camouflaged in a corner somewhere. I then went to the BBC website and spent a long time browsing the news. It was mostly a dull read. I was still scrolling through news sites when Louise called to me from the other side of my mosquito-netted window. Hey, Tony, are you going to dinner? Dan and Louise were an American couple staying in the bungalow next door. They were a few years older than me, but not by much. 
Dan was injured while serving his homeland but usually walked with the help of two canes. I noticed a wheelchair in the corner of their bungalow. I met them the night I arrived at the hotel. To be fair, Louise and Dan gave me a good look around while I dined alone. And yes, I was aware that they were watching me while I ate. They came up to me as I walked into the bar and explained that Dan couldn't dance anymore, but his beautiful wife loved dancing. They asked, since I was obviously alone, if I could join them at the table in the evenings and perhaps dance with Louise sometimes. I'm not sure what expression was on my face, but Dan quickly added that they were well aware that I was probably looking for some female company, so they wouldn't be offended if I met someone within the evening and we would move away from their table. I think they were rather surprised when I informed them that company of any kind, especially female company, was the last thing I was looking for in the world, and that I would be more than happy to dance all night with a beautiful lady whose husband would be taking her back to their own room every evening. What heaven did you fall from? Louise asked, the first time we went out to slow dance. Uh, sorry about that. I'm afraid beautiful women always have that effect on me when they're this close. Anyway, I have nothing against women in general, as long as they belong to one another and plan to stay in that relationship. I answered. What's that supposed to mean? She asked with a smile. Louise, I'm a normal, healthy man with all the urges that most men have. I appreciate the sight of a beautiful woman, but I've been burned three times. Never again will I get involved with any of them. Suppose you can call me a confirmed bachelor now. Are you saying that a handsome young guy like you is chaste? No, not really. It's just that lately I prefer casual relationships, preferably without names and definitely without the prospect of a long-term relationship. I got on well with Dan and Louise, and over the next few days they very skillfully extracted my entire life story from me. I learned about how Dan was wounded in action, literally blown up, while serving his country and how he suffered afterward. However, he managed to have three children with Louise, so his injuries did not prevent him from performing some functions. Their children were in the United States with their grandparents while Dan and Louise holidayed in the South Seas. After that first evening, the four of us spent most of our time together. Dan and Louise laughed and covered me on the beach while I stared at all those acres of flesh. On that special day, I was alone on the beach because they had gone on a day-long boat trip. Damn, is it already time? I haven't even started getting dressed. I shouted back to them, You better come in. I'll be there in a minute. I shouted, rushing into the bedroom to get dressed. I hope you dress up to the nines tonight. Louise called after them as they entered and poured themselves drinks. What's special about this evening? I shouted back. Louise's comment stopped me in my tracks. Did I forget something? I wondered. Did my new friends mention some anniversary or birthday that I forgot about? Tony, it's Valentine's Day. Louise shouted back. All those lovely young ladies who have been winking at you all week will be asking you to dance with them tonight. What are you talking about, Louise? I shouted back. But Dan answered. The tables are turned tonight, my friend, he informed me. Tonight the ladies have the right to ask us guys to dance. In that case, I hope Louise can take you out for a really slow dance. I really think she'll enjoy it, I teased. I'll think about it, but only if you promise to be ready to step in when I hit a wall, he said. You can count on me, my boy Danny, I replied, laughing. I had to change my shirt three times and my trousers once before Louise thought I looked up to par. The three of us then walked to the dining room at Dan's pace. Dan was in front. Louise was holding my hand from behind. As we walked, I told them about a strange dream I had on the beach. Louise chided me for falling asleep in the sun warning me that I could get seriously sunburned. I wonder why you dreamed of Mary Beth. With all these sexy young things around, Louise commented. Leave the guy alone, Louise. You're just upset that he didn't dream about you. Dan shouted back without turning around. I thought it was strange, too. I haven't seen Mary Beth for, what? Five, maybe six years. I guess it must be because I told you about her the other day, I replied. Do you ever dream about her at night? She asked. I can't say yes and I can't say no. I rarely remember what I dreamed about. 
I know that everyone dreams, but I'm not one of those who remembers their dreams. It's a pity, said Louise. Don't mind me, guy. She's upset that you can't remember any sex dreams that involve her. Dan chuckled as he walked ahead of us. Louise treated his remark with the disdain it deserved and muttered something like, burn old people's canes. Overall, our conversation was quite easy. Tony, stop it already, Louise scolded me during our meal. It seemed like I was constantly looking around the hotel dining room, trying to convince myself that Mary Beth wasn't hiding out there somewhere. Sorry, I can't help it. This damn dream was so real, I replied. The more I think about it, the more real it seems. With that, Dan stood up on his crutches and slowly looked around the entire dining room. I even walked a few steps away to see the bar. No, not a single red heat in the whole room. You're safe, kid. Don't worry, he said with a smile, returning to his place. Throughout the rest of the meal, they talked about their sea cruise on what they called a large sailing boat. I sat and tried not to look over my shoulder. When we walked out into the open-air lounge where all the dancing took place, the orchestra was already playing. After a quick dance with Louise to warm up, I asked the band to play a very slow tune before the dance floor filled up so Louise could get Dan to dance. It must have looked pretty funny to the uninitiated, considering that myself and one of the waiters stayed close to them in case Dan fell. Louise was right. Several women I didn't even remember seeing before asked me to dance. With them and Louise, I could hardly sit idle. But Dan always kept my glass full so I could take a quick sip between dances. It was about half past ten, and Louise and I were slowly twirling to the beat of the music when she suddenly whispered in my ear, Mary Beth, she's about five foot six? Yes, in sandals, I replied. Nice legs when she's in heels, huh? Definitely. And she's got quite the impressive pair of boobs, doesn't she? Wait, I thought to myself, just a minute? That was Louise's statement, not a question. Yes, but what are you talking about, Mary Beth, Louise? I asked. Well, I hate to bother you, handsome, but I think Mary Beth just came in from the beach. Don't look now, she hasn't noticed you yet, but she's looking. Oh, damn. So it wasn't a dream. I wonder what she's doing here. Well, it's just my feminine hunch, but at this point, I'd say she's looking for you, young man. What do you want to do? I have no idea. Maybe I should run. Why? She's just a woman, and if you ask me, very beautiful. What harm could it do if you dance with her, even if it's just one time? Louise suggested and then added, Oh, it's too late to run now, Tony. She noticed you. I assume she will be at the table as soon as we get back there. We'll go back there now. Isn't the dance over yet? Yes. I suddenly felt very tired. And besides, I'm just as curious as you about why she's here. Dance with her and then bring her back to the table. I'll get Dan to help while you dance with her. Me again. Louise was right. I had not yet sat down when Mary Beth appeared at my side. May I have the honor of this dance, noble sir? Mary Beth said with a slightly sarcastic tone in her voice. Okay, Mary Beth, what are you doing here? I asked as soon as we hit the dance floor. I'm on vacation. What else can I do here? But why in this hotel on this island? This is not the kind of place that can be called the beaten path. Well, I ran into an old friend, Amanda Mitchell. You remember her from college, don't you? Anyway, I told her that I was thinking of going somewhere exotic on vacation, and she told me that a relative was giving her a great time. The time is right here. So, here I am. Mary Beth, you know full well that Amanda Mitchell is now Amanda Smart. She married my brother, damn it. You were at that very wedding. Yeah, well... Amanda told me that her brother-in-law is having a great time showing off on this charming southern sea island, and I saw the photos you took, so I bought a very small bikini so I wouldn't look out of place here. But I don't understand why. I've arrived? Yes. Because you're here, you fool. I made a mistake once, and I've been trying to get your damn attention ever since. When you were married. No, I I'd rather not say that. It wouldn't be fair to me. I let you go. And what you did, and who you did with after that, really shouldn't have bothered me. But unfortunately, whether you like it or not, it's always been my business. In the end, I decided that I should take the bull by the horns. 
just like I did the first time, she said. And then, just as suddenly, as she had done in the student cafeteria years ago, her hands were on my neck and her mouth was tightly closed over mine. Mary Beth, I said when she finally allowed me to catch my breath. What? I know you like kissing me. You also like feeling my breasts press against your chest like that, don't you? Listen, Mary. You left us. I started, but not too loudly, because there were other people on the dance floor. Yes, I know, it was a mistake that I regretted all this time. A mistake? What do you call it? It seemed to me that you wanted to know what other guys were like in bed. After all, I was your only boyfriend, and I'm not as stupid as I look. Partly true, I admit, but that's not all. I was panicking up to a certain point, and, as you said, you were not only the only man I slept with, you were the only man I ever allowed to kiss me back then. Time. That's a lie. You kissed all my brothers under the mistletoe. Be serious, Tony. They're all too scared of you to actually kiss me, but we tried to make it nice. Well, you could have fooled me, too. You don't have to believe me. Ask your brothers or their wives. Anyway, whatever you believe, I can tell you that before your graduation, I had never even held another man's hand, let alone allowed someone to kiss me romantically. And after you left me? You actually told me to leave. You may not remember correctly, but I believe you said something like, if you want to try another guy, then get out of my life and find him. Did I say that? Pretty sure. Exams or not, you were drinking a little back then, and it was probably just the damn whiskey that kept you going. Damn, no wonder my grades were so bad. I barely passed, you know. I tried to warn you, but you didn't listen. But you left even though you say I was drunk when I told you to leave. Well, to a certain extent, you were right. You were the only man besides my father that I ever allowed to get close to me, so I admit I was a little curious. So you really wanted to compare me to others in bed, I said, loud enough that several other dancers turned in our direction. Tony, can we discuss this somewhere more private, please? Mary Beth asked. Yeah, okay. Meet my friends and then we'll find a place to talk. Dan and Luis greeted Mary Beth like old friends and fell into conversation almost immediately. Louise brushed aside my objections that Mary Beth and I were going to find a private place to talk and insisted on telling Mary Beth almost everything I had told her about our relationship. When I looked at Dan, he just shrugged, smiled, and then ordered another round of drinks. Where are you staying? I suddenly heard Louise ask Mary Beth. In some cheap place along the beach, I couldn't afford those prices, Mary Beth replied. Oh, Tony, you have another room in your little house. You should move there. I was surprised to hear Louise say. Wait a minute, I said. Louise gave me a scathing look. Oh, if he's going to act stupid, you can move into the spare room in our little house. You can't stay in that place. Dan and I saw him this morning. It might even be dangerous there. I'm sure they have the same security as here, I said more to seem like I was part of the conversation than anything else. No, some of these places don't take safety that seriously, my friend. It would probably be safer if Mary Beth moved into one of our cabins. You'll have to pay for food separately. Dan added, just in case. Louise, can we dance now? I said with a hint of irritation in my voice. Yeah, thanks, Tony. That'll be great. What are you up to, Louise? I asked when we went out onto the dance floor. Nothing, Tony. I'm thinking about the girl's safety. But Mary Beth and I were going to talk privately. You deliberately prevented that. Yeah, because you were starting to get angry. I thought you might say something you'd regret later. Don't I have a right to be angry? She almost told me she left to find out what other men were like in bed. She didn't say anything like that, Tony. I know I was standing right behind you dancing with that Aussie guy. The poor guy had no idea what he was signing up for when I asked him to dance. Now I believe that you should talk in the morning, when you are both calmer and completely sober. It is important that your conversation goes smoothly, Louise explained calmly. Important? Why? I asked. Because, my handsome friend, you are in love with this woman, and she is in love with you. You think so? 
Oh, I know. I saw it in your eyes when you first told me about her, and I see it in her eyes when she looks at you. Oh, really? Dan thinks the same thing. It's not just my opinion, it's Dan's opinion too. Remember, we watched when you started dancing together and when she kissed you. Didn't you say that she took the initiative the first time you kissed? Yes, she did. But that was then. And now is a different time. A lot has happened since Mary Beth and I were in college. I know this, but tell me honestly, what was the happiest period in your life? When Mary Beth and I were together, I guess. Those first years were great until I asked her to marry me, and then, well, everything went down the drain. Tony, when you return to the table, I want you to tell. Mary Beth, that all discussions are postponed until tomorrow. Tonight, I want you to act as if you had just met. Oh, and if you want to take her to her house and she wants to go with you, please take her. Why should I do this? Tony, look at that man over there, the one who can only stand with the help of two pieces of wood. I love him. I have always loved him. I almost lost him, but the good Lord decided to let me keep him. Mary Beth wants to get you back, and I know how she feels inside. Look, she is ready to do almost anything to get you back, and I know that you really need her. Don't ask why, and don't try to make excuses to justify your miserable existence. Accept the love that Mary offers and cherish it. Don't stop asking unnecessary questions. Does what happened ten years ago really matter now? Now is the time to dance with her again, and please don't talk about the past this time. You can discuss it tomorrow if you think it's still relevant. I noticed Dan, who had apparently been deep in conversation with Mary Beth as we approached the table, nod his head. At first I thought it was a greeting to his wife, but then Mary Beth stood up, took my hand and pulled me back onto the dance floor. Have you ever met Dan and Louise before? I asked. No, never. But they seem to understand us very well, Mary Beth replied. What do you mean? Dan said we were made for each other, which I agree with, by the way. Dan told me you're crazy about me and still in love, even if you don't realize it, she said with a smile on her face. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. Yes, and Dan said that since it's Valentine's night and we ladies should, or rather, have the right to take the initiative, I should immediately drag you to bed because tradition says that you should submit to my desires. Did he say that? Well, I think he's exaggerating a little, but I like the idea. What did Louise tell you? That we shouldn't talk about the past until we've spent the night on it. I started when Mary Beth interrupted. Together? Well, she kind of hinted in that direction, I answered. I like Louise. She's my type of woman. Mary Beth, I think I got hit by a steamroller. You're screwed, but I'm going to make you a deal. Tonight, well, what's left of it? We're going to treat each other the same way we did when we first moved into that disgusting apartment. Then tomorrow we'll talk about all the bad decisions we've made. Accepted. Oh, sorry. We'll leave Sally and Jane alone. They really had nothing to do with us other than being in the way. After we calmly discuss everything tomorrow, if you want me to get on a plane and go home, I'll leave. And what's more, I'll never show up on your doorstep again. I know you can treat me like one of your famous one-night stands, she added with a smile. How did you know about them? There's little I don't know about your life, Tony. Something unexpected happened on our way back to the table. An Australian woman, and a very attractive one at that, asked me to dance. And then her friend hit on me. It looked like they were both trying to dance with every guy in the place. When I finally sat down, I was feeling pretty tired. These Aussie girls were quite energetic on the dance floor. During my absence, the seats at the table had changed slightly so that Mary Beth was now sitting next to me. As the four of us chatted, the conversation was carefully steered away from the topic of Beth and me. I realized that Beth had both her arms wrapped around my left arm. I didn't know how long she had been doing this, but it was something she had done many times in the past. Throwing caution to the wind, and perhaps all rationality, I freed my hand from her grip and placed it on my shoulder. Mary Beth's chair creaked on the floor as she pulled it closer to mine. I know it sounds stupid, considering there was so much we really should have talked about, 
and maybe even argued about, before. But at that moment, I knew that Mary Beth and I would get back together. One night, I had to get up to go to the toilet. When I returned to the bedroom, lit only by moonlight, I found myself standing and looking at Mary Beth's beautiful and very naked body. What the hell went wrong? Why did we lose so many years? I asked myself quietly. We didn't lose them. We learned how terrible this world can be if we don't have each other, Mary Beth replied, making me flinch in surprise. So what now? I asked her, sitting on the bed and looking into her eyes. Children would be nice, but we need to hurry. The old biological clock is ticking, you know, she replied. Not a bad idea. Three. We talked about it, didn't we? I said, remembering our conversations when we were young. That was the plan, but if there are more of them, I won't complain. Shall we start now? She giggled. I could see the smile on her face in the moonlight. I thought we'd already started. No, it was just a warm-up. Now is the real event, she said, pulling me towards her. Several thoughts flashed through my dazed mind the moment I woke up. Firstly, and I think this was most important to me at the time, something tickled my nose. Secondly, I felt a weight on my chest that also seemed to be pressing my right side and shoulder into the bed. Thirdly, the light was so bright that I didn't dare open my eyes to see what the weight was. And fourthly, I heard several people talking in the other room. Raising my left hand to remove whatever was tickling my nose, I discovered that the culprit was Mary Beth's red locks, and at that moment everything fell into place. Apparently Mary was lying on top of me, having collapsed from exhaustion after our very energetic morning session. No, I won't go into detail, because then I'll never finish telling this story. Realizing what was tickling my nose and pinning me to the bed, I paid attention to the muffled voices I heard. It seemed that there were four people in the other room. I assumed that one of the voices belonged to a woman and three to men. The woman's voice, I concluded, must have been Louise's. I couldn't make out exactly what she was saying, but I would have recognized the nuances of her accent anywhere. This led me to conclude that one of the male voices belonged to Dan, but I could not figure out who the other two men might be. Then my thoughts were interrupted by someone knocking on the bedroom door. Almost without waiting for an answer, the door opened slightly, and Louise's voice asked, Are you still alive there? Just a minute, Louise. I was about to answer, when I realized that my movement or Louise's call had awakened Mary Beth, who shouted, Come in, Louise. We're okay. I desperately tried to get out from under Mary Beth to find something to cover my embarrassment with, but Mary Beth held me tightly. In fact, she prevented my attempt to speak by blocking my mouth with hers for a few seconds. When she finally allowed me to breathe and move, again, I grabbed the sheet to cover myself. God, Mary Beth, I'm naked, I exclaimed when I saw Louise standing at the foot of the bed and laughing at me. Oh, don't worry about me, Tony. You don't have anything I haven't seen before, Louise replied clearly enjoying my embarrassment, although I'm not sure anymore. Anyway, if you're done trying to destroy this bed, your breakfast is here. Dan and I ordered it. You realize it's almost lunchtime. Is that so? Oh, we got a little carried away, Mary Beth replied. Um, I better take a shower and I'll have to look through Tony's things to put on. No, you don't have to. Your bags are here. Dan and I moved them here this morning. Dan paid your bill there. Um... I think I said to prove that I'm still here, I guess. Don't worry, Tony. We understand you have a lot to talk about today. But if you have to, Mary Beth can use the spare room in our cabin. This simply cannot be, Louise, I answered decisively. Thank you, honey, Mary Beth said, and then tried to choke me again. Shower, kids, Louise said in an authoritative tone. And you better take them one at a time, or this breakfast will be stone cold before you even get to it. Besides, Dan and I can't sit here all day, she added, closing the door. Mary Beth released me, then stood up and headed to the bathroom. I tried to follow her, but she pushed me away, asking, please bring my suitcases, which is what I did, wrapping myself in a sheet. Louise giggled, and Dan, who was sitting back and drinking coffee, simply remarked, rough night, lad? 
you could say that, I replied, trying to simultaneously hold two suitcases and a sheet around me. I'm not sure I managed to keep up any decorum because as I walked back into the bedroom, I heard Louise say to Dan, Told you. That's impressive. Dan laughed and said something to her, but I couldn't make it out. You are more than enough for me, my love. Louise answered and laughed again. For some reason that I didn't understand at first, Mary Beth put that little black bikini back on. I saw Dan give her a couple of admiring glances and saw Louise elbow him in the ribs, to which he replied, What? We are here to admire the beauty, aren't we? Which caused another fit of laughter from Louise and Beth. When Mary Beth and I finished eating, Louise pulled out a notepad from somewhere and seemed to switch into effective secretary mode. She reminded me so much of my secretary when I would come into the office in the morning and she would be preparing to list my tasks for the day. Okay, while you two, uh, enjoyed the sunrise this morning, I made some notes, Louise informed us. God, did you hear us? asked Mary Beth. I think the whole damn island heard you, Dan grinned in response. Don't exaggerate, Dan. They didn't make that much noise, Louise chided him, and then continued. Anyway, Mary Beth, Tony and I have been talking a lot the last few days, and I realize that some things have been bothering him over the years. I'm not sure Tony really understood what was going on, but I think I do, especially after I met you. So I thought maybe it would be good to talk about them one by one and find out everything frankly. You know, clear the air a little so that there are no skeletons left in the closet. Wait a minute, girl. It's Mary Beth and Tony. Hush, Dan. Mother knows best. Louise interrupted him. Damn it, I hope so, Dan muttered. Okay, first thing, Mary Beth. When you turned down Tony's marriage proposal, he thought you wanted to try other men in bed. Louise, Dan interrupted. Dan, please shut up or go for a walk, Louise scolded him again. Truth and falsehood at the same time. Mary Beth answered without hesitation, but she hugged me around the waist. Several things were happening at once. Tony was struggling with his course. He started drinking too much, or so I thought. And without telling me, he rented an apartment in our hometown. I couldn't understand why he was telling me this didn't say. My friend called it a bachelor pad, and maybe I gave it more meaning than I should have. Did you know about the apartment? I asked in surprise. Stephanie Carter worked at one of the real estate agencies you wrote to, Tony. You didn't rent through them, but Steph found out that you signed a lease with another company. About, I answered. Then, after we had been together for God knows how long, Tony suddenly asked me to marry him. You know, I never thought about when we would get married. I just lived happily from day to day. Suddenly and without any harbingers, Tony asked me to marry him. I panicked a little and didn't really know what to say. I should have said yes right away, but instead I was kind of hesitant in answering and ended up not really saying anything. To be honest, I didn't even, I don't remember exactly what I said, but it must have been something like Tony was the only man I really knew. Anyway, Tony misunderstood and was under the impression that, well, you know, right? To put it bluntly, Tony thought that I wanted to sleep with other men before saying yes so see how he compares. Which was complete bullshit because the thought never even crossed my mind. He made me feel good, and as far as I was concerned, that was all that mattered. I'm ashamed to say that when he accused me of wanting to sleep with other men, I was hurt and very angry. Remember, at this time, I knew about the bachelor pad and he didn't tell me anything about it. So in my anger, I started to think that I had never actually even kissed another man. Romantically, that is. We had a lot of male friends, and I got along with almost all of them, but before Tony, any guy who tried to get to know me got turned down. So, to some extent, I did wonder what it would be like to date someone other than Tony. We argued about it for weeks, although I should have realized that Tony was on edge because of his final exams. But the more we argued, the more I wondered what I had missed. Finally, when he walked in at three o'clock in the morning into our bedroom, drunk most of the night, and demanded that I either give a wedding date or get out of his life, I exploded. Tony was probably asleep in the living room and went back to college before I woke up the next day. I called my dad 
planning to cry to him on the phone, and the next thing I know, my parents arrived and we started packing my things into the car. You know, I didn't even wait to find out how Tony passed his exam. My parents took me home, and I cried for the next couple of weeks. Dad said that if Tony really wanted me, he would come and get me, but he didn't do it. Eventually, I called his mother, and she told me that Tony lived in an apartment somewhere in the city. She couldn't even tell me his address. I asked her to beg Tony to call me, but he didn't. The next thing I knew, some of my friends were reporting to me that Tony was dating local girls, girls I thought were my friends. So I said two could play the game and, well, there was a whole string of guys who had asked me out before, so I spread the word that I was ready to date. My plan was simple. It was a small town without many good places to go. I would show up with some guy and remind Tony what he was missing out on. The problem was that he had no interest in me. He was too busy with those stupid girls whom I met. What about trying other guys? Asked Louise. No, I never found anyone I even liked, let alone a good kisser like Tony. Well, you know, they didn't even give me that good feeling when they kissed me. I promise you, none of them even made it to what the guys call first base. Although a few took some liberties on the dance floor, which I allowed up to a point, Tony had to get jealous and come over to deal with them. Well, that was mine, plan, but of course, this fool never did. Wonderful, I inserted. Well, you didn't. These guys were hugging what was rightfully yours, and you just turned around and kissed some little fool. Calm down, children. I think you were both playing stupid games when you should have been talking to each other, Louise chided us. You're so right, Louise, but despite the fact that I was developed physically early, I believe that I was quite a late child in other respects, if you know what I mean, Mary Beth explained. Looks like you were like that too, Tony, Dan commented. Now don't be mad at me or take it personally. But, damn, didn't anyone tell you that you need to hold on to your woman and fight for her? I'll take it personally, Dan, but I got the signals wrong at the time, I replied. Yeah, now we're getting to a whole other topic. Understanding what goes on in a woman's mind is almost always impossible for any guy. You just have to be there when they need you and take the bullshit other times. What's that supposed to mean? Louise exclaimed in response. It means I love you, honey. Sometimes I don't understand you or why you put up with me and stay with me. A worn-out old wreck, but I love you no matter how angry you get, Dan said, winking at me. Goodbye. I saw it, Dan. You're kidding me again, right? Dan had a mischievous smile on his face and winked at me, then showed me a little trick I've used many times since. He pulled Louise towards him and kissed her on the lips. A minute or so later, after she stopped resisting, he broke the kiss. But as Louise began to continue her reproaches, he again silenced her with a kiss. This was repeated for about ten minutes, until finally Louise lay quietly in his arms when he stopped the kiss. Dan looked at Mary Beth and I. The best part of fighting with your wife is the moment of reconciliation. Now I'm sorry, but Louise and I need some privacy. She'll have to help me up first, though, he added with the same smile. The bed in the other room is made. This will save you a trip, I winked at him. Thanks, Tony. I think we'll take you up on your offer, Dan replied. But my list? said Louise. To hell with the list, Louise. We have more important things to do. Besides, look at them. They can't keep their hands off each other. Whatever problems they had before are in the past. Suddenly I realized that Mary Beth was pulling me to stand up. What's happened? I asked. You filled your stomach and you've had enough time to recover. Now it's time to start making babies again. She smiled up at me. Mary Beth nearly wore me out for the rest of my vacation. Although she did not become pregnant, this did not happen until several months later. Although I don't think Dan and Louise were planning on having more children, we learned from a letter we received a couple of weeks after we returned to the UK that three were to join them. Louise was even in the public eye when she played the role of bridesmaid Mary Beth. Mary Beth had a job to return to in the UK and I didn't. I had a good amount of money in my account, of course, it was essentially hush money from Jane and my employers. It looked like enough for a single man to travel the world in style for the rest of his days. But buying a nice house and setting up a family nest with Mary Beth required me to start earning money again. For a while, I thought I would never find a job. 
Being fired from your job can turn off potential employers, even if it doesn't end up in court. Rumors are spreading, and other employers, theoretically, have no idea why your last employers suddenly almost emptied their bank account in your favor. They're a little reluctant to hire you. The problem with work was unexpectedly solved for me when, already in despair, I turned to one of the clients of my former employer. He told me that he was outsourcing work in my field and indicated that the company he used previously had inexplicably gone under. He hinted that the door is open to any new venture that someone might decide to create. I took the hint and became self-employed. Now I have a fairly successful company with its own office in the city. Mary Beth did not become pregnant until a couple of months after our wedding. I think I already told you about this. Anyway, then she started having another one every 18 months or so, until we decided four was enough. Mary Beth was already 40 at the time. We still keep in touch with Louise and Dan. They come to visit from time to time. We are planning to take the children and visit them in the U.S. next year. We think our youngest is old enough for the trip to be interesting for him. Sally and Jane? As for Jane, she eventually had to leave town. I've never said anything publicly, but you know how the rumor machine works. At least one of these guys had to talk, and she became the target of every horny youngster within a 50-mile radius. I don't know if Sally is still involved with her party, but if so, then I assume that her new husband doesn't mind open marriage. That's it, I think. Life moves on. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.